recording for soulpurpose.com and I'm here with Evan Skytree Snyder who is um, an electronic music producer and uh, one of my favorite Facebook feed characters someone who <laughs> uh, regularly and routinely posts interesting not only interesting and amazing uh, music and, and artwork of his own and from other people but also someone who's really keyed into the visionary frontiers of science specifically uh, you know geology and solar science and space exploration and uh, Evan you and I we we kind of first collaborated last year at Rootwire Festival during a, mm -hmm. a discussion in the art gallery in which you and I kind of tag teamed about the the relationship between crystal technologies and the evolving human techno spiritual exploration of you know carrying our ecological matrix out into space in living right. ships so like right there is this is this really juicy nexus where the art and the science uh, come together in a, you know this you know these visions of our human future and our, our destiny and you know they also speak to you know where we come from as a species and the you know the sort of the continuation of these really ancient human projects uh, you know our our relationship to the stone and and the natural world you know mm -hmm. and uh, so could you tell people a little bit about your your background in in both the arts and the sciences and and how it is that you came to to uh, diving into and and sharing this this really rich synthesis with people sure um my uh, academic background is in solar engineering with an emphasis in solar thermal technologies um as i mentioned the last time we talked kind of the low-hanging fruit of uh, renewable energy and uh, in terms of uh, artistic background, um, my uh, very first memory uh, as a human being in this incarnation was uh, <laughs> tearing through the cupboards uh, of my parents' kitchen in Colorado uh, as you know, really young uh, physical being and beating around uh, with wooden spoons and whatever else I could find on you know bits of metal and kind of just you know hammering out uh, my uh, understanding of the physical through sound uh, and that's continued on ever since you know that's a big uh, core aspect of my sonic expression is just finding different things to sort of whack on and, and hear it respond and ping back and then chop it up rearrange it and see where it can go musically that kind of reminds me I don't know if you've listened to the uh, I think it was 2009 the Regina Spectre album far and she has this uh -huh. <clears throat> this track in there, track five, uh, hooked into machine, where she performs all of the percussion on um, this experimental percussion instrument that David Byrne of Talking Heads made out of an entire building. It was uh -huh. this, art, this installation project, you know, uh, where he was he was turning architecture into instrumentation, and That's right. yeah. and then the, it was beautiful because it. It was like linked into this perform, you know, the performance of this song, which was for her, uh, you know, the song was about, uh, was kind of like a science fiction exploration of, you know, the what it may be like to live in the future, and you know, in this, this uh, symbiotic relationship with our technologies, you know, and it was kind of a it was kind of a dark and, and creepy song, but it was a really you know beautiful and, and majestic. You know, mm -hmm. and I think there's I think there's something of that in, in your music. It's very um, there. You know, they're really grandiose, sweeping intensities. You know, a lot of a lot of like twisted metallic noises and and, uh, you know, it really speaks to, I think, that sort of that feeling that many of us have when we're turned to face the future of, you know, what uh, what. Otto called the Mysterium Tremendum, which is this this vast mystery that is, you know, so beyond our ability to understand that it's terrifying. You know, we quake before mm -hmm. it. So, I mean, is that is that something that you're really like conscious of as a musician, or are you 
kind of in more of this celebratory play space with respect to the unknown and, and the, the destiny of our species and all that? Well, um, I, I do vacillate um, between, you know, both perspectives, but predominantly uh, find myself resting in the, the core space of hope <laughs> of an optimistic future. But either way, um, I like to explore the possibilities of the future itself to simply um, show a, a window or to provide a gateway in, into which one can peer into a potential future, I think is innately hopeful. Whether or not that, that future is something that you would describe as uh, uh, utopian or ecotopian or idealistic or whatever else uh, you might slap on there, um, to remind ourselves that there is a tomorrow no matter what. Um, and that there is a vast gulf of unknown between where we are now and where we could be in relatively short periods of time uh, in this logarithmic expansion of human consciousness, uh, I think is an exciting thing to do. And uh, I'm hopeful about it predominantly um, because it's more fun and it gives me more energy. And uh, if anything is going to make a better future for everybody involved, um, it's being hopeful. It's a self-catalyzing process, not something that is... Uh, you know, inherently naive, um, as I posted on Facebook a couple days ago, uh, optimism is not necessarily naivety, it is the perpetuation of that which we can be optimistic about. Um, so I do try to explore that through music, and uh, sometimes go into dark places with it too. You know, sometimes a very non-utopian uh, future is expressed musically, only for uh, a measure, and then back to a more hopeful vision, or, you know, whole, whole albums uh, in the future probably will be focusing on more dystopian type themes as well so well I it's guess fun there, also there is that um you know you and i are also really uh bound and connected through uh the work of george atherton or geoglyphics the the uh digital visionary artist whose work mm -hmm. also very very uh neatly expresses both of those poles you know both the sort of demonic and the angelic possibilities that stand before us in our future you know my Graduate professor Sean Hargens at John F. Kennedy University said, um, things are always getting better, always getting worse, and always already perfect. You know, so I think, I think there is something that we're being called to do in order to step into, you know, a, a practice of hope as a deliberate choice rather than a, an automatic defense mechanism emotional response to an uncertain and turbulent age of transition is to recognize uh, both possibilities, to see the entire spectrum and to, you know, to do our best to, um, you know, hold them both, you know, to recognize mm -hmm. that the world is, is big enough um, that, you know, what, what may look like a positive future to one culture may look like a very negative future to another. And it's not always, the answers are not always so clear cut. Mm -hmm. So I guess that kind of gets back to, um, you know, for me, like there, I see a similar synthesis in your work, uh, between the two cultures of, of art and science. And I'm a little curious about how it is that you have, um, you know, how your scientific background has informed and, and impregnated your musical career and, and also the way that you communicate with people, um, you know, as a performance of your worldview. Well, um, I think the most concise way to express that uh, is finding the uh, unity within perceived dualities. Um, because that for me is often where the, the greatest, most potent truth resides. And I think that's something we talked about actually our second conversation we ever had uh, in detail. Um, it for me is a, a fascinating way to uh, even look past uh, this uh, perception of a uh, dystopian or a utopian future and simply focus on the future itself in all of its expressions. Um, I feel like uh, by uh, reaching towards that um, center space uh, through art is a great way to sort of uh, look into what might be um, unfolding in our future without putting too much heavy emphasis on it, without putting too much of uh, scientific gravity on it, for example. Um, a lot of, uh, in my opinion, the more visionary uh, scientific engineering minds of the past century 
uh, often expressed uh, their ideas through science fiction. And uh, you can see that now continuing on in, say, the work of Graham Hancock, um, who has, uh, because of flack for his uh, rather, uh, you know, outside the norm uh, expressions of thought, uh, <laughs> decided to uh, <laughs> go in the direction of exploring more fiction and science fiction as a means of purveying those ideas. And for me, music is a fantastic vehicle in which to catalyze those um, extrapolations, those visions, those uh, creative, spiritual, personal expressions of uh, present, past, and future uh, without making it too serious. <laughs> and it's a lot more fun that way. So. Yeah, there is there is a uh, this moment, kind of a defining moment for me in my own understanding. I, I attended a master class by the uh, uh, Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones bassist Victor Wooten a couple mm -hmm. years ago. Fantastic, you know, absolutely world class musician, and he had just finished a book called The Music Lesson, which was a what. Um, uh, Tony Levin, who's another amazing bassist, called sort of the Carlos Castaneda of music in that it was a, a, a vessel for all of his, you know, esoteric insights into the musical creation process. But it was told in a fictional narrative. You know, it was told as a, as a dialogue between master and student. And when people asked him, asked Victor, uh, why it is that he had decided to pass on the, his body of knowledge in a novel form rather than in like a workbook or a textbook type uh, vehicle. He said that mm -hmm. when it's told in fiction, um, you, you bypass people's defense mechanisms. You bypass people's scrutiny because if you, if you explain something to people as true, then they're automatically going to critique it and evaluate it and, you know, automatic, it's, it's the same as like if someone says, oh, trust me, trust me. And you're like, well, why are you saying that? <laughs> you know, so there's, you know, there is something exactly. about how, you know, like um, to tell a story or, you know, to present a worldview through a work of art or music um, in some way allows the user to, to take it, to internalize it, to take it in, to make it their own without this challenge of a truth claim. You know, and, you know, I find that that sort of seems to me to be the bridge between the way that I understand art and science in that, you know, science is is very when it's practiced responsibly is very much about provisional thinking. It's like, well, this is what we've got so far, but this is also, you know, just by the nature of human thought, a um you know, a story that we're telling, and it may turn out that it, we, we end up telling ourselves another story in 10 or 20 years time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, in what ways do you, are, are, do you hope that the story that you are trying to tell is communicated through this music? Like, how is it that you see um, this sort of ecotopian future expressed in your sound? <laughs> That's a, uh, that's a really awesome question, my friend. It's probably one of the best I've uh, received through an interview uh, in recent memory, and there have been a lot of good ones. Um, I, uh, I feel that um, the unfolding future, as uh, I see it personally, is um, more playful than it had been in the past, uh, especially during my time in school for solar engineering, where, uh, to be honest, a great deal of that... Uh, passion that I had for, for solar, and still do to a significant extent, was driven by a fear of a possible future, um, a need uh, to avoid a uh, resource-scarce type scenario. Um, and uh, that by shifting directions to music, um, I was able to uh, alleviate some of that fear and focus more on the abstract expression of, of the possible rather than avoiding the probable, um, as some may see it anyway. <laughs> uh, and that um, it's, uh, it allows me to do more work, actually, uh, through what I do best um, to affect uh, things for the better. Um, there is uh, a lot of hope, I think, in, in engineering, um, especially if you look at uh, figures like Buckminster Fuller, who 
um, made it a, a modus operandi of his existence to see what one man could do for humanity. And uh, he, I would argue, succeeded uh, in proving that the answer to that question is a great deal, um, especially because a lot of his ideas have yet to fully blossom and bloom into our collective experience um, at the scope I believe they will, uh, especially because, you know, the uh, necessity of the technologies that he pioneered um, is uh, still on the horizon, still growing and unfolding. Um, but to go back to the, the question of uh, expressing that future in sound, um, I uh, consistently embed the sound of, of uh, textures and other beings around me, other life forms, um, and uh, you know, integrate uh, bird song, which to some extent has become a bit hackneyed and perhaps uh, overused and, <laughs> uh, and cliched, but for me is an expression of the inherent uh, biodiverse nature of the future as I see it and hope for. Um, combined with uh, the technological wizardry of, uh, you know, an unknown um, collective expansion of uh, so many bizarre <laughs> and, at this point, relatively unpredictable inventions that uh, continue to crop up every day. Um, to express that inventiveness through sound um, is a very playful way of, uh, you know, uh, showing the creative spirit of human consciousness without necessarily grounding it in a device or something that will give somebody clean water in Africa, which is obviously very commendable. Um, I would like to, through what I do best, which as far as I can see is music, um, help to catalyze those types of ideas that will have maybe more grounded uh, material uh, benefits for everybody uh, by, you know, just getting neural pathways to fire maybe a little bit differently uh, to uh, align and uh, in some cases maybe even break down if somebody's confused by what they're hearing, <laughs> which seems to happen. It takes a little digestion sometimes, you know. It takes a little digestion, exactly. And, and that's honestly a, a one uh, beautiful facet of music that I think has the great capacity for, uh, for good if you want to you know, go the black and white duality route, uh, that uh, music is a means, a uh, delivery vehicle of uh, rewiring uh, human brains. And uh, I'm, uh, I think, at a point where I need to, tr to tread very carefully with this statement to not suggest that I'm going a cultish route of purposely <laughs> trying to get people to think one particular thing. <laughs> exactly. But I think it's, it's healthy to, uh, you know, maybe at least defatigue certain neural pathways because, uh, for example, it's been shown that if you're trying to remember a particular word or a term or a historical uh, factoid, whatever it might be, and it's on the tip of your tongue, so to speak, that one of the reasons why we can't often remember those uh, words or, or dates or factoids that we're trying to recall is because the neurons have been firing so much that we've depleted those neurotransmitters. and those pathways no longer function. So if you want to, for example, like remember a particular word that you've been trying to struggle with in your conversation and looking like an idiot um, with respect to for about 30 seconds or more, uh, <laughs> one way to trick yourself is to think about a, a related uh, idea or a related thought or word and you bypass those fatigued neural pathways and often will be able to recall that, you know, that word that was on the tip of the tongue and not able to be expressed previously. So I feel like Music is a great way to uh, defatigue, at the very least, uh, neural pathways that throughout the course of our day, especially with respect to more mundane activities um, or you know things that we don't necessarily feel um, super excited about that may be very repetitive, uh, to allow our brains to rest and to rewire and to daydream. Essentially, the daydreaming phenomenon I think is a very powerful, uh, healthy uh, expression of human consciousness. Yeah, there's that that, you know, um, the, I can't even pronounce his name, the author of Flow, you know, he, he's this guy, he's studied, um, it's like Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, but, you know, <laughs> he, he, he spent his entire career studying um, how it is that uh, people get into these, these sort of creative genius states, 
you know, and one of the things that he, you know, he wrote an entire book on, on creativity, um, interviewing sort of, you know, these internationally recognized creative uh, exemplars. And one of the things that he, that <clears throat> will come as no surprise to you that he, he kept finding was that they all would, you know, sleep on a problem or they would go for a walk. And like you said, they would, they would allow the, uh, the unconscious mind to chew on it, you know, that they recognized not only that, I mean, they, they recognized basically the inhumility that our intelligence as beings is much deeper than our own ability to consciously process and, you know, solicit an answer, you know, so you mm -hmm. have a lot of these really, you know, the sort of the esoteric history of science, which, um, to me bridges it with visionary art, which is that, you know, it was an angel that descended to Rene Descartes and said, here, here is the Cartesian, you know, what, what came to be known as the Cartesian plane and through math, you will conquer nature. You know, the, uh, it's what we now know as, as Buckminster Fullerene, you know, this carbon mm -hmm. 60, uh, molecule was something that emerged from an earlier discovery of the benzene ring, a six carbon ring that appeared to the, uh, the chemist in a dream of a snake eating its own tail, you know, mm -hmm. and, and like these, these sort of, um, dream state or, or, uh, you know, visionary experiences that lead through this, this creative interplay between, you know, essentially unconscious and archetypal patterns that, you know, lead to these, these real, uh, demonstrable scientific uh, breakthroughs, but you got the, this Buddha pillow on the couch behind you, and like something that I, <laughs> I couldn't help but but think about during your talk is uh, you're you're going to be down at uh, the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in New York this fall, um, playing a show, and I think probably you and I are both really deeply inspired by uh, Alex Gray's book, The Mission of Art. Have you read that? Absolutely. It's uh, right over here on the bookshelf, actually. And, and the, the data is tentative. It's still being worked out in terms of details, but it's looking highly likely. And I'm very excited to um, to be there either way on the near horizon. So. Yeah, well, regardless of whether or not that gig actually occurs, it's like you, I think, I feel like you and I both understand that um, that there is this direct transmission like there is through through the gaze in Buddhism or in Hinduism of these subtler energies that an artist imprints upon their work and then are received at that somatic or subconscious level by those viewing or, or listening to the work. But then, mm -hmm. you you know, so there is, there's, again, that's sort of this, um, <clears throat> it's not exactly a fictional narrative, but it's a way that we bypass the, the rational, skeptical, you know, uh, guardian of a worldview and allow these things to sort of unfold and flower underneath the floorboards of a person's awareness. Um, Absolutely. Do you, let's see, I had a, uh, I had a question here for you regarding the way that you select sounds. Cause like when I'm listening to your stuff, what I hear, you know, I mean, it, it may just be because I know you, um, but I hear, you know, these sounds that to me evoke images of like living architecture and like the, uh, the bubble ship in the fountain, you know, this sort of like ecological vesicle, you know, and this notion that our technology is coming together with our, our uh, you know, our biology. And that in mm -hmm. fact, you know, I think a big part of the the paradigm that you and I are both really curious about and interested in articulating through our, our respective works is this notion that this is sort of a, that it's time for us to transcend and include both ends of the spectrum and recognize, for example, the, the ways in which the worlds that we consider in the modern paradigm, inanimate, you know, the worlds of the of vegetation and of the geosphere. And then, you know, as an extension of the geosphere are, you know, what Kevin Kelly calls the technium or, you know, the, mm -hmm. the technological layer 
of the earth, which he regards as the seventh kingdom of life, are, mm -hmm. you know, that th this is all the performance of, you know, a single entity, a single phenomenon. And that, you know, while it may have made sense for us for a few thousand years to relate to the world of the made as distinct in some sort of fundamental and like ontological way from the world of the born, Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that 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 um, in in some sense, it's time for us to discard that dualism in order to move forward responsibly into a world where, um, you know, technology, we, we acknowledge in humility that technology is ultimately out of our control, but that we have this this responsibility as stewards or as as uh, parents to guide and shape and inform uh, the evolution of what comes next mm -hmm. so is this something that you feel like I'm, I'm curious about your ethics you know and like mm. like I feel like I have a, like a, a moral responsibility towards uh, you know um, disseminating this vision and clearly you know you're someone who came out of you know the the renewable energy world and you know this is I, f I feel like how is it that you're your ecological and your moral sens sensibilities inform the way that you not only write your music, but also practice your career as an artist and like the way that you walk in the world. Um, <laughs> Another good question, my man. Um, I feel like a, uh, a great term that comes to mind is uh, one that um, maybe uh, literally defined somewhere. I haven't uh, looked it up yet, but uh, the term is geodiversity. Uh, the idea of, uh, say, the technium living uh, side by side with the geological or the biological. Um, in, in biology, for example, you often find the greatest complexity in, in the fringe zones, the areas where, say, the lagoon and the, uh, the cliffside meet, or the areas where the, the sands of the desert uh, run into the oasis. Uh, you'll find the most juicy, uh, dense, and uh, interesting uh, interplays of life dynamics in those regions. And I feel that for, uh, you know, maybe the past uh, several thousand years of our collective human expression, we've often seen the, the technium or the architectural as a static and uh, uh, hmm, potent tool for controlling and for, as you mentioned earlier, conquering nature and uh, the uh, fizzy, uncontrollable, chaotic stuff over here as something to be conquered and as something to be brought into that linear, very regimented, uh, architecturalized uh, vision. And um, I feel that, uh, for example, through studying uh, solar uh, power, solar engineering, and architecture and engineering, that um, the idea of the Earthship, as pioneered by uh, Michael Reynolds out of Taos, uh, New Mexico, is a beautiful expression of how those two seemingly, again, uh, separate uh, dualities can be unified and uh, a beautiful truth, a beautiful fundamental resonance of, of human uh, expression and, in my experience, in being in an Earthship, uh, a sense of bliss and uh, uh, interconnectedness. Um, can unfold in very beautiful ways. And musically, um, I uh, often find myself expressing that through the very uh, linear, regimented sounds of a, uh, you know, finely dialed uh, patch uh, in a synthesizer, or a uh, fairly linear um, 144 BPM uh, rhythmic structure with something more uh, not even swingy, or not even uh, something that has a, a lilt to it, but is almost uncontrollable. Every measure might have a different swing or a different uh, sort of offbeat uh, movement to it. As if the uh, rhythms themselves are almost gaining life and getting up and lumbering around and accidentally stepping on things and tripping and sometimes <laughs> doing a little backflip and, and discovering things about themselves uh, through the injection of the organic, um, the uh, bliss that I experience when combining those two elements, both through, say, sitting in an earthship and listening to music that expresses similar uh, 
similar motifs and uh, interconnections and geo, or in this case, uh, maybe sauna diversity, um, is for me a very exciting place to be and helps to, again, bridge the dualistic structures into something that uh, you can sit in the center of and uh, look around you and get kind of this panoptic view of uh, things that before seemed very separate, but uh, now are interlinked and uh, communicating with one another. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, I think that, um, to be honest, I've frustrated some producers that have sat in with me or uh, <laughs> students that have been watching me on Skype to, to see how non-intuitive um, parts of my process are and how intuitive some of them uh, are in seeming contradiction because I'll spend hours getting the beat structure just right. And then sometimes I'll just toss in a texture that, you know, I won't even think about. I'll be like, that's the one, that's the one that needs to be there. And it might not even seem rational or uh, in tune with the mix at all at first, but uh, part of it is just throwing it in and trusting almost like uh, you just let a frog loose in the room and uh, you have no idea what it's going to do, but it's probably going to be fun. And uh, hopefully, uh, there won't be anybody you know that will step on it. <laughs> Basically, I, I, I also love uh, you know for example mineral specimens that have a lot of different uh, species within a single specimen. Um, I have a couple in, in the room here. I could uh, maybe grab if you want to yeah. see an example. <laughs> this will just take me a second to uh, pick one up. Yeah, this is the uh, show and tell version. You know, your album was. Your earlier album was Crystal Consciousness, so we're, we're getting into that here. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so this is uh, a piece of, well, our Mother Gaia, or uh, Earth, depending on your perspective, or, you know, terminology you want to use in the moment, uh, that is uh, quartz and pyrite and uh, hematite, and there's a little bit of sulfur here on the back that is a little bit more difficult to see, and some calcite as well. And uh, it's a expression to me of the, um, if you want to look at it in the left brain sense, the, the chemical interconnections of all these different seemingly separate species. For example, you could look at uh, the pyrite that's in here in its more singular context, just on a single matrix of the pyrite cube, sort of this indivisible uh, platonic solid uh, <laughs> expression of something that over here is a little bit more messy. So, um, I like to, uh, instead of you know just the cube itself, find pieces that are on the matrix still to sort of give it the context of where uh, and how it grew. Um, and in the case of pieces like this, to see how you can toss all these things together and get these uh, very interesting mixes to uh, start expressing themselves. And uh, for me, they're in a way like, a, if you just look at it in a very uh, meditative sense, uh, objects of meditation, uh, objects of focus to remind myself of those patterns of expression. And, uh, you know, without going into the metaphysical or the esoteric energetic aspects, uh, something to ponder basically when I hold them. So, yeah, I, I guess, you know, looking at that, that, uh, first specimen that you showed us, it immediately evokes what you were just speaking of about the, the sort of interstitial areas where life diversifies and you can see this even at the chemical level that clearly that's mm -hmm. a stone that emerged you know it at the uh, you know in a, in a boundary region between you know different chemical compositions and was probably you know worked over and you know retreated and you know it was there's something about that that uh, fertile intersection that just really you know may you, you what you know whether or not you consider this like an anthropomorphism, you know, we can regard as a lesson of that stone, you know, mm -hmm. as, as, you know, a teaching to be found through the contemplation of it. So Absolutely. there is a term that you used that um, I positively adore that I wanted to circle back to just a moment ago. Sure. You said a panoptic view. And mm -hmm. I was just listening to, um, you know, with respect to, our various, uh, you know, utopian or dystopian visions of the future. I was just listening to the audiobook of Jonathan Zapp's Crossing the Event Horizon, The Singularity Archetype, and Human Metamorphosis, which mm -hmm. is a book that e examines the, uh, the psychological dynamics of what we regard as the apocalypse or the singularity, this notion of a transformative event at the end of human history. 
-hmm. and the way that that is connected to our own uh, personal intimations of mortality. And there's a chapter in that book on near-death experiences as a microcosm of the apocalypse and the way that, you know, oftentimes what we, what we regard uh, kind of, you know, through the science fictional intuitions of our destiny as a species, um, you know, this notion of a, uh, you know, a frictionless telepathic sharing of consciousness between individuals, this notion of, you know, the ability to, you know, move freely through space and time and to observe the world in this totally uh, resplendent, exquisite detail um, that is currently unavailable to us as, you know, the human, as human organisms. This is something that appears in people's visions of the after death state, um, in, you know, in, in reported NDE after NDE. And he, you know, he specifically speaks to um, this woman who was going through an experimental surgery to uh, treat an aneurysm in her, in her brain, um, where they had to drain all of the blood out of her f body. They had to like refrigerate her body, drain all of the blood out, and then essentially operate on a frozen corpse before they like resuscitated her. And mm. in that. That's during that time, <laughs> yeah, during that time, um, she was uh, vividly aware of the entire operating room, like simultaneously able to see under the table, to count every shimmering sparkle on the stocking of the nurse, to to re to you know to she was able to identify these these uh, very unusual medical uh, tools and instruments that were that were kept in boxes until she was basically dead. There's no way mm -hmm. for her to have seen this stuff, but she had this, what is frequently reported by, by NDEers, which is this, this infinite, infinitely resolute spherical view. And there's something about that, the, the, the spherical view that also shows up in the Probably it would be earliest and, and in some respects the most profound work of science fiction, um, a book that that deeply inspired Arthur C. Clarke and, and a lot of these other later authors, uh, Olaf Stapledon's Last and First Men, in which, mm -hmm. you know, we've, we're looking billions of years into the future at, you know, multiple r generations of human civilization, you know, as we move out into the cosmos and his 18th race of humankind has eyes um, both in the back of their head and on top of their head, and mm -hmm. that they're they're linked telepathically into this this um, planetary super or like rather meta organism, where each of them experiences not only their own unique individuality but also the total individuality and uh, you know uh, sort of global sentience of the aggregate of human experience, where mm -hmm. they regard themselves not only as human body shaped individuals but also this greater individual which covers the entire surface of our planet which is looking out into space through you know a million telescopes a million eyes this you know a spherical creature and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting to me that this thing keeps coming up over and over and over again that we you know you go all the way back to 1930 and it's already obvious that a, a principal characteristic of the coming paradigm is of this spherical panoptic identity view. yeah right. the panoptic view but then mm -hmm. you know you get into it's it's also present in the dystopian view where you know we're you know here we are in in summer of 2013 and edward snowden has just leaked the uh, existence of prism and these other nsa surveillance programs and the total uh, awareness uh, system. <laughs> right, and we as Americans right. are having to, to come into this recognition, this rather uncomfortable recognition that we live in what, you know, dystopian authors have for a long time called the panopticon. You know, this mm -hmm. glass house, uh, universal surveillance in which, um, every, that, in which privacy does not exist. So there is this, you know, to me there's like this... Um, that represents sort of the the terror of the mortality of our, you know, the paradigm from which we are emerging. Uh, you know that we 
we're having to like reconcile exactly how to to relate to the dissolution of this boundary as the self becomes you know uh, experientially embedded in these much larger and much more sentient structures of consciousness because suddenly we're living the dream of Terence McKenna each of us you know exactly. we, we you and I in talking about this call uh, you wanted at some point to, to bring up the, the peril and the promise of Google Glass, you know, which <laughs> exactly. you and I are going to be playing with in New York next month, you know, and this yes. notion that really it's just an extension of the smartphone as a way of layering the collective human experience, the collective human knowledge onto individual experience, you know, and suddenly each of us are in communion with this greater intelligence. But mm -hmm. what most people don't consider is that the price of that is the you know the increasing transparency of the individual to that greater intelligence so Absolutely. i would love to hear you riff on that for a while and see you know <laughs> you know what it is that what it is that you've been thinking about this change um you know what how it is that you understand what we're going through as a species right now absolutely well um you know the uh initial aspect um if you can still see me it looks like the uh uh, frame on your end froze a little bit, and I lost signal. You're totally fine. All right, cool, cool. All right, so we're we're back. Speaking of this, you know, <laughs> spherical technological uh, consciousness joining us all together, uh, one of the hopes is that sometimes it's dysfunctional, <laughs> and that could be a, that could be perceived as a negative in situations like this. But uh, a moment of you know, privacy, please. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I. Uh, I uh, had a, a landlord uh, uh, a couple years ago who um, put a piece of uh, tape over his uh, iMac uh, camera uh, that he lovingly called his anti-HAL device. <laughs> um, the ways of sidestepping this, uh, this global total awareness slash panoptic uh, emergent paradigm are readily available. And... Uh, relatively simple as well, for example, a piece of tape um, being enough to, say, perhaps uh, prevent a NSA uh, contractor from watching what I'm doing right now if I were to cover the camera. Um, the inherent, you know, double-edged sword phenomena of any technology being a positive or a negative, depending on the conscious choices that we make in utilizing those technologies, is, of course, the, the crux of the whole, uh, the whole process, expanding and moving outwards. Um, I feel that uh, what's happening with, with Snowden at the moment and, uh, you know, the international uh, complexities and sort of relative confusion emerging as a result of it <laughs> is, uh, is deeply serious, deeply uh, uh, hmm, moving to experience and to witness, has immense ramifications, and yet is also very similar to a uh, wild goose chase or uh, say watching the uh, the three stooges uh, run after each other and <laughs> trip and fall and do all these you know slapstick <laughs> maneuvers that are inherently hilarious as well I, I don't mean to trivialize whatsoever the uh, the job that uh, all of the uh, government workers trying to protect our national security um, which is what they believe they're doing and the, the gravity of Snowden's position as well, um, these are very serious issues. And yet they're a natural expression of this unfolding uh, panoptic phenomena um, that I see as uh, a, not to be too weighty with it, but a necessity of survival on this earth into the 21st century and beyond. Um, the ability to commune as a central organism um, a central consciousness, I think, is integral to our ability to deal with uh, situations and uh, issues that have now become a collective, global, shared uh, set of uh, issues to face. Uh, for example, uh, Russia recently issued a, uh, another threat to the U.S., um, perhaps uh, a bit hollow uh, in its um, depth to... Um, severely uh, punish and uh, to push back against uh, organizations like Monsanto that are um, basically exporting these 
corporate forms of uh, what they perceive, and many do, as uh, warfare, essentially, in um, especially circumstances of uh, harming bee populations, which are integral and necessary to global crop sustainability. The uh, key to our survival, and, and in a way the um, deepest expression of our collective fear, is, is one and the same. So again, looking at the dualities collapsing down to the central unity, um, I find that if I sit in that, in that central space, uh, of uh, the mandorla in, in sacred geometry terms, which, for which, example. By the way, mandorla, for those who are not familiar, the mandorla is the, uh, this like vaguely egg-shaped halo around the, the Virgin Mary, you know, mm -hmm. in, in Christian iconography. It's, it's also the, you know, the vesica Pisces, which is the intersection of two circles, where the mm -hmm. circumference of each circle is at the center of the other circle. So it's, it's this notion, rather feminine notion of the perfect interpenetration of complementarity, which occurs Absolutely. as a sort of cosmic vagina through which everything emerges. And oddly mm -hmm. enough, I think that came up in our la the, the other call I had with Rich Doyle just a couple of weeks ago. But, <laughs> but anyway, go on. Oh, for sure, for sure. No, it's, it's for me a, a, a constant uh, um, theme that I come back to when I'm conflicted between you know, one idea and the other. Uh, trying to see how they create that Venn diagram, that overlap in which the uh, you know the density of expression and potency is maximized. Um, I feel that with respect to these these dualistic perceptions of individual versus other, or this collective um, panoptic total awareness system versus the uh, sacred uh, individuality and uh, indivisible nature of our uh, personal consciousnesses. Uh, the mandorla or the overlap of those two circles as I see it is uh, increasing blend of the two increasing kind of uh, oscillation of those two circles coming to that center point over time sort of uh, as if you dropped a uh, rock in the middle of a pond and you watch the ripples and the interference patterns splay out and over time start to settle uh, that you know, we've just thrown via our technolo technological and cultural um, paradigm at the moment a massive rock into the pond, <laughs> and uh, these ripples are <laughs> these ripples are very complex, and and the you know interference part of the interference pattern is uh, what we seem to be focusing on more, but there is still the second part of that phrase, which is the pattern, and that. Um, Again, the greatest truth in my experience being the center point of those two seemingly separate circles. Um, the, not necessarily stagnation, but the point at which the dust starts to, st starts to settle, I believe will be the point at which we come to recognize the um, utility and the uh, benefits of this panoptic view with still the indivisible nature of our own consciousnesses. That um, I am, for example, and I believe you are as well, and, and everybody watching this, uh, as free as we perceive ourselves to be, that all of the legislation and all of the um, bots or maybe even physical human beings somewhere, uh, maybe not even too far from here, uh, watching us right now, They're right <laughs> should there be you. any? <laughs> They're all around. <laughs> I, need, I need the eyes on the top and back of my head to, uh, to keep my eye on this Buddha, for example. Um, <laughs> that uh, I am again as, as free and you are as free as you perceive yourself to be. So um, while wearing your Google Glass on the near horizon, um, you still will have your own private thoughts. And there are, you know, of course, the dystopian visions of even that realm being penetrated and infringed upon. Um, but uh, looking at the realistic unfolding expression of these two, again, seemingly separate paradigm, finding the center point, trying to find that a mandorla, um, to me is a, is a hopeful uh, expression of uh, uh, finding the optimism in both sides and uh, retaining the freedom that we ultimately always have as core individuals uh, well into the future um, in collaboration with and sometimes in contrast to the more panoptic aspects of our technological sphere. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, 
while I share a great deal of my ideas and my self-expression and um, other uh, passions and other individuals work through my Facebook page and other social media platforms, for example, that uh, the individual that I am is still something uh, that um, even is unknowable to myself on a fundamental level. That taking this to a more metaphysical level, the um, idea of the the Maya or the um, the very dense physical illusion and the transcendent unified God consciousness of all things, um, seemingly separate poles of uh, metaphysical thought, um, can be again unified in that uh, we are expressing both at this time, that, that the physical self that you are and everybody else watching is, and you know, the desks that we have in front of us or our computers, whatever material stuff is around us, is not necessarily illusionary. It is a, a facet of the uh, fundamental reality that extends above and far beyond uh, that which we can see and touch. But that doesn't make this trivial. It doesn't make this dualistic structure of, of self versus other inherently meaningless. Um, for me, it's part of the purpose in being here. And that, um, that Mandorla point is not necessarily all-inclusive because it is not the shape of a circle. It is the shape of the cosmic vagina or the, the, the almond of, you know, <laughs> ultimate reality. Um, that the circles still serve their purposes, that there is still inherent meaning in the Maya, um, the illusion that is not necessary, necessarily illusionary, and the transcendence, that they are still, uh, in a way, unified, yet indivisible. Um, and uh, that, for me, is just a, another aspect of hope looking onto the horizon, so I don't really see that changing uh, fundamentally. I see it morphing, and uh, the interference patterns perhaps becoming more confusing, but the uh, self-expression and the freedom that we all have as individuals, as consciousnesses, uh, will remain fundamentally locked in our cores and, uh, again, not even necessarily accessible to ourselves, um, something that is uh, forever on the horizon of mystery, essentially. And that Google Glass cannot even penetrate, you know, certain realms of our own understanding, let alone the subconscious mind or the hidden realms of consciousness. Yeah, I, um, you know, sort of my understanding of this is that... Uh, you know, when people talk about get involved or to evolve as these, you know, injunctions to participate and to practice, um, you know, these, these terms, uh, again, sort of in this more metaphysical aspect, refer to the, you know, the descent of spirit into form, involution, and the descent of, you know, the ascent of form into spirit, evolution, you know, mm -hmm. um, at least in this sort of more, you know, metaphysical theological way. And that um, where they intersect is the the crux of human the human condition. You know that we see mm -hmm. this this the archetypal uh, symbol of the cross as one of a, just a, a few a handful of universal human symbols that uh, emerged, you know, in cave paintings and have a, a, appeared in every society since, um, and archetypally represent the same thing everywhere we go this is like a part of our being you know it's an underst it's an understanding that there's an the intersection and the you know the combination and so it's interesting to me you know that um the the cross ended up winning the evolutionary race as the dominant symbol of christianity over the fish you know the the vesica pisces which actually has a cross in it you know right. at the at the edge in you know that sort of intimates the circles you know, as a more feminine and sort of a larger framework, but that, that, you know, this is really about the, you know, the intersection of our, our, um, infinity and our, our limitedness at any rate. I mean, um, it seems like, you know, you and I are both kind of, uh, perched in that intertidal zone here, um, perched in that intertidal zone where, you know, the, the extreme, of one paradigm is the the sort of conventional core of an, another paradigm and and here we are moving you know uh between them uh collectively and and personally in, in a way that uh is is like you said you know it's sort of a frog loose in the room 
You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's turbulent and unpredictable. And yet, um, you know, we look around us and this, you know, in many ways, it's, it's still a very familiar environment. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, the more mm-hmm. that we externalize our, our mystical intuitions in, you know, concrete technological applications, the more we, you know, we realize that um, the, the two are not actually as separate from one another as we, as we previously understood. Mm-hmm. So, and in that sense, I kind of want to, you know, I want to wrap this call up and I really, you know, I thank you for your time and, and, uh, you know, meeting me here in the, uh, the intermediate cosmic vagina of FaceTime to, <laughs> um, to discuss, you know, that, that same, that same unity between sort of, you know, this spiritual energies, uh, communicated through a work of art. And then also the, the more like, you know, base, energies of you know the the you know financial and economic world you know, i think both of us are really really hip to charles eisenstein's vision of a, a sacred economics as being a big part of the world into which we're moving and i know that that's also a big part of uh your recent initiative with your your fundraiser campaign for your new album you know mm-hmm. an, an attempt to involve people in the you know the the community support of a you know, a, a precipitate expression of this way of seeing and, you know, to, to uh, participate and to assist you in, in what essentially we hope uh, everyone recognizes as a sacred endeavor, but one that is also bound up still within the context of, you know, the, uh, the Federal Reserve note, you know, and having Indeed. to, uh, having to cough up a bit of our hard earned dough in order to purchase your, your next CD. So <laughs> you, you want to rap with us about that? It's, it's, it's a really cool campaign that you've got going actually. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, there was something I was thinking about, uh, with your previous point about the, uh, choice of, uh, the Christian cross, uh, becoming the symbol of, uh, Christianity and then Jesus Christ versus the, uh, the Jesus fish predominantly. Um, the cross focuses on the, um, the intersection, but also those uh, seemingly diametrically opposed curves, um, whereas the uh, Jesus fish starts with a single point and unfolds uh, these 180 degree phase, uh, I'm trying to move my hands correctly, it's kind of <laughs> difficult to do while looking at you and the camera at the same time, but you can, you can sort of perceive it. <laughs> there we go. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Yeah, starting with the point and uh, seeing these two waves 180 degrees out of phase coming back into the cross, which is the tail at the end of the fish. Um, for anybody who's taken uh, macroeconomics class, for example, you know that the inverse curve of uh, supply and demand is a recurrent theme, and finding that point in the middle where both are balanced is the <laughs> is the ideal. And and that's <laughs> that really is uh, what. Uh, this campaign is about at the moment trying to find that center point of supply and demand through a new form of crowdfunding expression. Um, <laughs> if you turn, and if you turn that graph sideways, what you get, mm-hmm. uh, kind of, uh, you know, pun intended, is what Chris Anderson called the long tail. You know, mm-hmm. where you know you are directly communicating with the small subset of the population that to whom your work directly appeals. You know, so right. you've you've met the supply and demand in the long tail of that economic fish. <laughs> yes, <laughs> or I'm, I'm attempting to find, find the balance, and it is highly experimental in that sense, uh, but it is uh, uh, something that um, in a way grew organically out of the concept of the album itself, which is titled Cirrus Sapiens, um, a riff on the idea of uh, a cloud community, essentially, uh, a shared collective expression, um, but the sapiens uh, evoking the human, the fundamental, indivisible freedom of our own consciousnesses and our own expression. Um, because uh, not only is the project being crowdfunded and uh, crowdsourced in that sense, but it's also a highly collaborative effort with a bunch of uh, other amazing musicians and producers and artists and conscious engines, uh, like yourself, for example. Um, and <laughs> and uh, it's a very interesting uh concept to see unfold because in a way I can't even 
fully predict uh, what it's going to turn into or how it will uh, ultimately manifest at the end of the uh, the tunnel uh, once that light starts to uh, to open up and my perception and everybody else's too. Um, all I know is that this is what uh, feels to be the most uh, expressive, the most uh, enjoyable, juicy uh, thing to express right now through music. And uh, anybody that would be interested in supporting the, uh, the campaign um, is uh, basically helping me to co-create in, in a very literal sense uh, both the material uh, merch aspects of the process as well as the catalytic consciousness uh, to create and to continue to produce these tracks. Um, for example, if I if I get a donation uh, one afternoon that um, has a note attached to it, which pe people will often do, they'll write a little you know thank you or you know a little note of encouragement, which is wonderful. Um, it literally gives me a big boost in energy, and I'll feel more compelled to create that day. So I'm increasingly feeling interconnected to my community, not just in the social sense, but also in the creative sense, and. Uh, it's, it's really, really beautiful. Sometimes scary because I have to trust that uh, we'll meet our goal. And uh, if we don't, the project still is going to manifest somehow because it has to. I feel like it has to, essentially. Um, yes. <laughs> this is. <laughs> I was going to say Sparta, but <laughs> I was going to say Skytree after that. I was like, neither one of us is this right. This, this is humanity. Essentially, this is a grand experiment overall. And, and this is one facet of that grand experiment. A, uh, uh, infinite uh, experiment within a larger infinite set of consciousnesses. Um, so I, uh, I want to uh, say thank you very much to anybody out there who has shared up the link that has uh, you know, sent me a note of encouragement that has uh, dropped me a few cents or a few dollars or more, um, or you know, has even sent out a conscious ripple uh, <laughs> by enjoying my music, because uh, to be perfectly honest, I believe that helps. and. Uh, on some level is felt and appreciated. So um, that also, you know, extends to the very physical, real uh, aspect of what we're doing right now. And uh, and you're taking the time to do this uh, for uh, you know the collective as well as the individual aspects of both ourselves and everybody else watching and uh, everybody connected to Soul Purpose. So um, I'm just really stoked. I'm excited to see where this goes. I have no idea, but I also feel that uh, the laser vision of this process, the sort of teleological sonic attractor at the end of history, <laughs> will get us there. I'm just uh, trusting that will be the case. The big sound. The big sound. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Well, thanks, man. I, uh, I really look forward to spending some time with you in your new place next month. Life and uh, I really uh, hope that uh, those of you listening out there have been enriched by this silly conversation. Or at least yeah. laughed a lot, or, you know, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot to consider in the world, and, uh, you know, I commend you for, for doing the good work, man. So, thanks again, and, and uh, have a beautiful day. You too, man. Uh, namaste, and uh, this is one of those little mudras I've been doing recently. It's uh, a little bit different than the typical heart mudra. It's connecting all the fingers together. Kind of this tensegrity, as Buckminster Fuller referred to it. It's a little bit stronger. It feels uh, more uh, Mandorla-like to me. Exactly. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> we can, maybe we can fishtail it at the bottom there. Oh, we could. We could, yeah. But then also, if you bring it together, you can see that the heart itself is, in a way, very similar to that Vesic of Pisces, that, uh, that Jesus fish and the cross are all very uh, ubiquitous in their expression. <laughs> we'll have to play with that when we see each other in person. Have a great day, Gladly. my friend. You as well, man. Peace.